experiment you want to do is, so what, what I'm going to talk about today is um, a lab, we're talking about lab experiments and field experiments. Uh, they're a part of economics which have been kind of more important. And uh, we're thinking about those, thinking about how they relate to other things. But before I do that, let me tell you a story, which is about uh, the value of theory when you do empirical work, and even more so just about it. Okay. So when I, when I came to Chicago, uh, I came from, from Cambridge, and, and I had a very Cambridge view of the world. And at that time, Cambridge empirical work, you didn't have to think very hard. It was very formulaic. Or you had to go find a, a natural experiment or some kind of law change, and there's just a set of rules of thumb you use that carry you through uh, in a very cookie cutter way of writing a paper. So uh, we, uh, myself, and Julie Cullen and Brian Jacob, had were looking at the question of school choice, and uh, we had found a good instrument, which was distance from uh, where you like. How many schools are we're close to? In Chicago, you can go to any school you want. Okay, you just all you have to do is apply to the school, and they'll let you in. It's almost complete school choice within the city. And so the kids who had a lot of schools around their houses had a lot more school choice de, de facto than kids who do. And we were using that as a sort of an instrumental variable approach. Okay. So we wrote the paper, and I signed up to, um, the, well, Julie signed up to give it at Northwestern, and I signed up to give it at Chicago a few days later. And so I went up to Northwestern when Julie was giving it, and I was sitting in the audience, and she was giving the paper, everything's going fine, and then Chris Tabor, a very good economist, said, Wait a second, I think you're totally misinterpreting um, your results. You know, people always say that, they're always wrong. <laughs> and so <laughs> he, he went on to explain, he said, the thing is, like 40% of the kids are opting out of the local school. And the comparison you're making is, um, you know, you're comparing the, the outcomes of the kids who remain behind at that school to the kids who opt out. And to the extent that the kids leaving, uh, are actually affecting the experience of the kids who stay behind, you can't interpret your IV the way you want to interpret it. Okay? So there's, there's a case where, a rare case where actually you had to worry about general equilibrium effects when you're doing, when you have a, a natural experiment because enough of the people were being shocked around that, that everything was changing. Okay? And, and Julie's reaction was, no, you're totally wrong. That's, there's always a reaction to speaking up there. But I, sitting in the audience reflecting on it, I realized like within five seconds he was totally right. We had written this entire paper, three authors, you know, reasonably smart people had written an entire paper completely misinterpreting our own results. Okay? And so I quickly interceded and I said, Chris, you're totally right, yeah, we, we made a mistake. And so the problem was I had to give this paper three days later at, at the GSB workshop that like all the best empirical people come to. And we had already circulated the paper. So three days was long enough to go through and for us to rethink everything. I mean, you didn't have to re-estimate things. You just had to think about what it actually meant. So I get up there to start talking. And Chicago seminars are very tough. And the toughest person of all, if you can guess, is Kevin Murphy. Okay? And so not more than 30 seconds into my workshop, Kevin says, I was looking at your paper, and you, you can't interpret your culture like that. And but you know, Kevin, is, it's often hard to understand for regular people to understand what Kevin means because he kind of talks in various codes and stuff. And so I said, I said to the audience, let me just explain what Kevin means. He's totally right. Okay, and I basically translated in the way that Chris Tabor <laughs> explained to us um, what Kevin was talking about. If, if Chris hadn't explained it to us first, we never would have understood what Kevin was talking about because he didn't say it very clearly. And, I, and basically, Kevin's shaking his head with everything I said. Kevin's shaking his head, and I, and I said, Kevin, I could, I could see how you might have gotten the wrong impression from the way we wrote that first draft. But obviously, you know, you're right. You can't like that. And, and it turned out to be one of the most successful <coughs> seminars I ever gave because, like, every ten minutes, Kevin would say, "Well, that's exactly what I was talking about at the beginning." I said, "Kevin, you're right. Did everyone see that's what Kevin was talking about." <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it turned out. Okay, so a couple of lessons there. One is. You just, well, rules of some are valuable. You, you got to think about what you're doing. Okay, we made a terrible, terrible mistake in not thinking about what we were doing. Just saying, okay, well, it's what we've always done in the past. We don't have to think about the economics underlying our problem. 
it's just a natural experiment, right? You, just, you don't have to think about economics. Okay, we were wrong about that. The second thing is, to be successful in this profession, never forget that there are other people who are far, far smarter than you are, and if you can steal from them, learn from them, whatever, you should do it, right? And the fact that Chris Tabor was smarter than we were turned out to be great. The fact that Kevin is smarter than we were, that was great. You just gotta, you got to keep open-minded about learning from people and not, as if there's a tendency to think, oh, you know, this is my job market paper and I've given the talk four times already, you can't be right about stuff, but, but, um, but being willing to say that you're wrong is an important part of the team. Uh, and okay. Uh, so, that aside, let me just uh, motivate this discussion about lab versus field with a little bit more general discussion about fads and trends in the profession. When I came out of grad school, which would have been 1994, uh, differences and differences were the hot thing. That and endogenous growth models. Okay? And basically what that meant was if you had average skills and you were writing a good differences and differences, just like a solid differences and difference paper or an endogenous growth model, you got a good job. And people who are talented will tend to do good jobs no matter what. And the question is if you're just average and you end up writing the kind of paper that is hot, then you have a much better chance of getting a good job than, than you probably deserve. Okay. So, uh, so now I would say what's hot is dynamic I.O. anything. Okay. So people have almost no talent but can figure out how to, especially a dynamic contracting model of something. Right? It almost doesn't matter what it is, it doesn't matter whether it makes sense. Just if you're like average and you can write down something that, that has those words in it, don't you agree when you're laughing? But it's so true on the job market. It's always see it's dynamic estimation of stuff that no one cares about. Yeah. Okay? And, and, <laughs> and these are people who generally will, will not get tenured anywhere. Okay? Because it's not that they actually have very much talent or they're writing interesting papers. They just happen to be doing something, and people say, wow, these guys are really teched up. These guys are like cutting edge, you know. Um, you know so now, it used to be, if you did the same with BLP, right? So if you went out and executed BLP, you guys like, oh, guys got skills, gotta get this guy, okay? Now you write BLP, like, oh, it's BLP, right? So it's, this is moving target. Um, it's not always about technical stuff. It, it's, all, it's about topic areas, it's about approaches, okay? And it's my strong belief that the, the, another, another, so another area that's hot right now, or has been, is anything development or anything trade. Right? So, you know, if you're out, you know, if you, you're out in a village someplace in Africa, that goes a long way towards getting you a job, even if you don't, aren't very good. Okay. My, so my strong belief, it's always hunches as you think, is that natural field experiments are going to be the next, uh, the next thing where even if you have no talent, you can get a good job just by virtue of, of, um, of doing it. Okay? And so that's one of the reasons why I think, and I think lab experiments are actually a place where even if you are talented, if you're doing lab experiments, you're gonna have a hard time finding a job uh, in the next five years. Uh, I think the tide has really turned against lab experiments uh, in recent years and will continue to turn against them. Okay? So as part of the backdrop to thinking about um, my decision. I got, I got three lectures to talk about why I would talk about that. The other reason I'm talking about it is because John Liss was supposed to give this lecture, but he flew off to Germany unexpectedly. I uh, left, uh, left uh, me to give it for him, and I wasn't creative enough to think of something better to talk about than what he was going to talk about. Okay, so let's start with lab experiments. Uh, let me just first describe the process of running a lab experiment. Okay, so lab experiment, you get some idea, uh, you come up with some treatments, you uh, tend to do power tests uh, to figure out how many people you need to treat. You go through the IRB to get human subjects approval. You advertise uh, with flyers or some email list or something like that. You uh, run a couple of sessions with a bunch of college students. Uh, it takes about a half an hour to analyze the data. Uh, it takes about two days to write the paper and you're done. Okay. So one of the great virtues of lab experiments they are incredibly easy to do. Okay, that, that basically, they basically take care of themselves. Okay? And, you, and someone who's creative, like John List, who I, is, I think one of the premier lab experimental guys in the world, can actually get like two or three papers out of a given, he'll round up a set of college students and get two or three papers out of one given rounding up of college students. Okay. 
So let's just talk about it. So other than the fact that they're incredibly easy, let's talk about the pros of that. Of that. I mean, I would tip on it, really. Okay, so the pros. Okay, so the first one, okay, and I don't think you want to discount this. Like, you might think I'm, not, I'm making fun of it, but writing papers that's incredibly, that are incredibly easy to write, I mean, that's a virtue, right? If you can write seven papers <coughs> in the same time it takes someone uh, to write one dynamic structural model of whatever, that's like seven papers, right? And, and maybe your seven papers aren't going to count you know, seven times as much, but they're going to count for something. So finding easy stuff is not a, there's no virtue in, in writing hard papers. Right? It's, not, it's not this labor theory of value. Like it's, if you've got a good outcome, you've got a good paper, it doesn't matter whether it took you a day to write it or it took you five years. Okay, so they're easy. So what, but what are the real, what, like what are the real selling points? Of lab experiments. All right, so it's going to be very conversational. I'm not going to lecture you the same way I did last time. Let's let's just have a conversation. There are no real right or wrong answers to these questions. More yeah, control. More control. More control. What do you mean by control? Um, you know, you know what uh, what treatments you're going to really. You know how to divide the people. Okay, so okay, so two things. So one is you get to test what you want, right? That's by, I mean, you get to you get to you get to pull the lever. You can decide what lever you pull in a lab experiment. So you can pull the lever that says uh, I'm going to change prices or how much you want to change them. You get to pull the lever that says I'm going to uh, have a um, uh, a very unattractive person reading the directions or a very attractive person reading the directions. Okay, you control that kind of stuff. Uh, the other thing, though, that's related to this is, think about natural experiments, right? Because it's the opposite of the natural experiment. The natural experiment is opportunistic, right? You go out, you want to study something about pensions, and you don't get to actually write the legislation in some states that changes pensions. You should go out and figure out what you can. You can't always answer the question one. But, but that is a virtue of controlling the agenda in the lab experiment. Okay, and the other thing, the key thing, probably should be at the top, is you have randomization. Okay, what, what good is randomization? What, why is randomization useful? I mean, there are there's subtleties to it. I mean, it's obvious points. What's that? So you go direct, since you go directly to causality, right? So do you need econometrics? No, you don't need econometrics. You don't need uh, assumptions, really. You just basically uh, take a mean of one group, the mean of the other group, you take the difference, and that's, uh, and that's, uh, that's kind of it, right? So that's, let me, so, so a lot of people, could, a lot of people criticize, I'm going to get to the cons later, but let's go do one criticism of experiments. You hear the criticism all the time, well, experiments are not useful. Like Jim Heckman, my colleague Jim Heckman, would say, experiments aren't useful. Okay, why would he say they're not that useful? With, oh, even aside, aside from that, he would say what, what, what structural guys say all the time is something about the question is they have any external validity. He would be on, They say something different, right? That we're going to talk about external validity too. But what they say is they say, well, it's just all you're going to need is a mean, right? All I can compare with an experiment is the mean of the treatment group, the mean of control group. I want more, right? Guys like Heckman want it all. They want to be able to map out. They're like pagans. They want to map out the whole distribution, and they say the experiment can't give me that. Does that criticism make any sense at all? Well, it could, because you could study how to treat them from different quantiles of the variables that you are. So you've got to be a little careful, because you only really have the random. You've got to make sure you've randomized quartile by quartile, right? Yeah. You, but do you, okay. So, uh, yeah. But in any case, uh, I mean, you can't possibly lose anything because you randomize, right? So like whatever, whatever econometric methods you're using on non experiment that you can just use some experimental data and it can't possibly make a big difference. Okay, can people hear that? So the, so the claim here is you can never lose anything by having randomization, right? The randomization is only uh, a zero or a positive. Okay. And that's exactly right. I mean, I, I, that is 
could not be more true. That you would never, if given the choice, say, unrandomize my data. Right? There's no better thing than randomization. Okay. So that, that criticism, which you'll hear all the time, where people say you, all, you can only learn about X, because it, you, know, you can only learn about the mean. You're not giving me the parameter I want. Okay? When it comes to, and, and so, so I know like uh, Angus Deaton and John List had this argument, where Deaton said, well, uh, randomization doesn't do stuff. And I think by the end of the conversation, John had convinced him that he was actually wrong. And that, um, and that indeed, uh, you, that, that the, a lot of the criticisms that Deaton was making of randomization were not actually, um, were not well, actually. Steve, just to, I mean, to push back a little bit, I think what Jim would say is randomization is not free, right? That like, yes, Conditional on being in the lab, you would definitely prefer to randomize than not randomize, but that the, the environment that surrounds your ability to randomize lets you you lose something. I assume we're going to so, get into this. Yeah, thing. I'm going to get into that. But, I think, but they often don't say that. They often yeah, will say very explicitly, they will say, 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 all you're learning about is the mean, and that is not an interesting economic parameter. Trevor? So I, it seems to me that there are cases where you may want to unrandomize your data if you do care about sorting, if you care about the total derivative of your effect, and not just this partial that you're looking at. Does that seem real? Um, I still think that in any situation you would want, you would you would prefer to start by randomizing people and then letting some sort and not other sort. And that's and that's the best way you're going to right so so it's 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 a little tricky, but you clearly always you're always better off when given the choice between you may not want to randomize every single dimension of it because there are there are issues like that in sort. Okay. So just something to remember that you never want to you never want to walk away from randomization if you have a choice to do it. Right? You always want to move in that direction. Okay, what else is good about it? Okay, so we got the first three on my list. I still got uh, well, I said one more. Okay, little or no econometrics needed. So you have the option of skipping econometrics. Um, but let me just be clear. It doesn't mean you have to skip econometrics. Right? Anything you can do with non-randomized data, you can do with randomized data. Right? So if you want to build a structural model after you've run your experiment, no problem. You can still do that. You haven't lost anything. Rarely, if ever, do people do it. I'll, I'll talk a little bit today if I have time about a paper that does it. But, but yeah, it's, it, it's nice and that you don't that you have the option. OK. Uh, okay. You can replicate yeah, uh, those experiments. No, you can't with natural. Yeah, easy to replicate. Okay, and the last one on my list none of you are ever going to get, uh, which is that you don't need to know anything about economics to run that experiment. Okay, which is not necessarily a virtue. Okay, it's a virtue and a curse. But it is, it is true that you can carve out a very successful career as a, uh, a lab experimentalist without knowing anything that Kevin put on the board. Okay? You can just, you can kind of operate in a different space that doesn't require you to, um, to know it. Okay. okay, and that's a virtue because it's hard to learn economics. Right, it takes time. You, you know, to come here, spend a week, whatever. We so could have spent that writing, writing three lab experimental papers instead. Right, if you were a lab economist, you could have gotten three papers out of the way at the same time that you're going to be here uh, at this. Uh, uh, at this uh, okay. So, for all these reasons, now I think that I let's see what we got here. I might have forgotten to even put it on here. I think I did in the end. I think. Okay, so for all of these reasons, lab experiments have been exploding in the profession. So there's a graph that I meant to put up, that I've got to put up. But um, if you just look at the graph of how many lab experimental papers have been published in economics. Okay, it's basically, essentially, this is going back to like the 1930s. You go back to the 1930s, there's like one paper every five years or something. Okay, so it's like basically right here. And then it really, I mean, it, it 
really takes off. I mean, partially that's partially that's because all publications are taking off. Um, partly it's because the journal there's like the, the, there are lab there are lab economics journals now that are publishing a lot. Of, but in general, it's just been exploding. Okay, Brandon Smith wins the um, the Nobel Prize. So this should really uh, come to the fore. I think it's, lab experiments have been incredibly uh, persuasive and important to the profession, particularly uh, in motivating behavioral economics. I think the intellectual foundation of behavioral economics comes out of Kahneman, and Tversky, and Thaler's work showing that like in the lab, people just blow it all the time in ways that are very predictable and very replicable. And that, and that led to people like Matt Rabin uh, winning the Clark Medal for trying to bring fairness considerations in. Now, Ernst Fair has had a great career working on these, these kinds of issues. Okay, so let me give you an example of where the lab, or you might think the lab would be pretty useful. <coughs> that would be in uh, trying to look at the issues of altruism or, social, or, so, or, or what they call social preferences. So by social preferences, I just mean that people seem to care about, in my utility function, I seem to care about other people's payoffs, or other people's utilities. Okay. Now, let's just say, how, how, how would you in general, let's say you wanted to figure out the question, determine whether people are altruistic. Forget about the lab. What do you want to do in the real world? How would you, how would you try and prove that in the real world? Or how would you try and measure, I guess, how altruistic they are? Charitable contributions. What's that? Charitable contributions. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's say that. So, there's a, there's a guy named Booth, who um, recently gave three hundred million dollars to the University of Chicago's GSB. Um, now, how would you? How do you? How do you measure? Actually, I got to stop talking about that. They're going to send this tape to him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I take my risk. Whatever. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. I'm sending you to Okay, so um, <laughs> <laughs> how do you know it's altruism, right? I mean, they named the they named the school after him, right? And maybe maybe he, he didn't know that they were gonna. He didn't acquire that. No. Hear that? <laughs> All right, I'll give you a better example. Then. I was at, I was talking at some place, some university somewhere, and the um, and and the, the football stadium was the T Boone Pickens football stadium. Where was I? Oklahoma or someplace? Uh, Tennessee. Where is it? Wasn't that Tennessee? Oklahoma State. Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. State. The Oklahoma State. That's right. That's where I was. Um, again, it's very, very complicated. Or let's say that let's say that your barn burns down. Okay, we're living in the 1850s or something, and everybody in the neighborhood comes over, and we all have a big party, and we have a roast pig or whatever, and we build your barn. Isn't that altruism, or is it just that I think my barn is going to burn down someday, and if I don't come build your barn, I know no one else will be able to help me. It's very complicated when you have repeated actions uh, and reputation uh, to figure it out. Okay, and this kind of motivated the people, uh, early experimentalists like Thaler, to come into the lab and try and test it in the lab, because the beauty of the lab is you have control, right? You get to pull the levers. You can you can make things anonymous. Okay, so that there's no um, there's no reputation effect. You can make things one shot games, so it's not repeated, and you can um, you know you can design simple environments in which you can really attempt to parse this stuff up. Okay, and so the simplest uh, the simplest approach in the lab is with the dictator game. Okay, dictator game. Uh, incredibly elegant in its simplicity. Uh, we bring two two of you come into different rooms in a lab. You'll never meet each other. It is one shot. It is anonymous typically, and uh, and then the you know so for instance we would give you like a five dollar show up fee just for walking in the door. We would randomly assign one of you to be the dictator. That dictator would be given an additional five dollars, and then the entire game is the dictator decides. How much of that five dollars to give to the other person? That's the end of the experiment. You walk out the door. You get to keep as a dictator everything you didn't give away. Whatever you give to the other person, they keep. Okay. That's the whole experiment. Okay. So first, just the, let's do the obvious thing. What's the economic solution? If you're the dictator, what's the right answer to how much you should give to that other person? Yeah. 
Nothing, right? I mean, why should you give that person anything? You don't even know who they are. They could be like a mass murderer or something. And, and, and uh, you know, when you, when you ride the subway, right? When you ride the subway, lots of people around you could give $5 to, but you never do, right? So there's no reason why suddenly you show up in a lab and you give them $5. Okay. Uh, so they, just, they play the game. Now, this is an example of that game, uh, exactly as I described. And here's how much money gets transferred. And so what you see, and this is pretty typical, this, this is from John's uh, 2000, John 2007 paper, that a lot of people tip zero, sort of, 30% of the people, that's actually high, usually it's more like 15 or 20% of the people tip zero, okay? But that's still saying that, you know, 80% of the people are doing what the economists suggest they shouldn't do. Like, a, a bunch of small amounts, always you get a pretty big chunk in two and a half. Like, it's pretty rare to get people over here, but, but, but on average, I think if you go through the literature, it's something like 30% of the amount that you give to the dictator gets passed along to the next person. Okay? So that's a resounding failure of economic theory. And that's terrible. I mean, how, I mean you, could, you could barely have come up with a theory that would perform worse in practice than the model that almost every economist would, would espouse, which is that when I have a one-shot game with a stranger, uh, I'm just not going to be giving away a lot of money to that person. Okay? So, you know, it's not inconsistent with certain economic models. It's easy to put altruism <coughs> into the utility function. That's fine. But, but our basic model, which says people are self-interested, fails terribly. And that's, I think, why people like Ray Van Amman got so excited, because this gave theorists uh, a reason to, um, you know, to, to exist in this domain, which was to try and figure out why it was that our basic models So, you know, people like Ernst Fair have devoted his whole career to studying games like this and showing how important these social preferences are. Uh, you know that. Okay, so what are the cons of lab experiments? All right, we've already gotten, we've already mentioned one of them, right? So it's this idea of, um, what did you call external, what you guys call it, external validity or something like that? Okay, so the, the, the phrase that John and I like is, uh, is generalizability. And that whatever happens in the lab is not so clear you can generalize it outside of it. Okay, but why? Yeah, that's a, we think that's true in many cases. But what are the specific reasons why it's not generalizable? I think it's important to understand those specific reasons to think about when a lab experiment would or would not be a good answer to the question you're trying to pose. So what are specific reasons why lab? It's basically the study of college freshmen and they're a very specific um, demographic okay. group. All right, the non-representative subject pool. Okay. Now, if that were the only problem with lab experiments, how hard would it be to solve that problem? Yeah, it'd be trivial, right? You just if you want to study traders, you bring traders in the lab. If you want to study CEOs, you bring CEOs in the lab. If you want to study um, grandmothers, you bring grandmothers. Okay, so this it turns out, so two things. One thing, empirically this isn't very important. It turns out that college students and, and everybody else look, play every play most games a lot like each other. Um, and it's easily solved. So, so a lot of people have put a lot of emphasis on this one and it's, and, and it's our belief that this is actually one of the least important of the reasons why it's a problem. Yeah, buddy? Well, if you want to uh, test something where people are making decisions over large amounts of money, it can be really expensive. Okay. So I mean, honesty over twenty dollars versus honesty of like you know um, stock traders or whatever corporate executives. Yep. So small stakes. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is a fact of life that most lab experiments are played for small stakes, and behavior could clearly differ for small stakes and large stakes. Now there are some end runs you can do around this. So for instance, uh, there are incredibly poor parts of the world. Um, like like uh, the former Soviet Union back in, in the 1980s, when people would go uh, to, so um, uh, Al Roth and some co-authors went there, and they could like play for a month's salary. Okay? And what they actually found was that people, it was actually not the dictator game, it was the ultimatum game. And with the ultimatum game, it's like the dictator game, except if you don't give the guy enough, he can reject it to both get zero. And it turned out people played surprisingly uh, made surprisingly big gifts and were surprisingly likely to reject, even for super high stakes. But, but stakes clearly very important. Maybe another reason why I actually want to uh, get into the causality of the questions for policy purposes and then uh, 
maybe maybe answering the question from a, in a lab environment would not be so useful than uh, answering it in the field. Because no one will believe your results, you mean? Because you, because you can't go in front of Congress and say we should. Um, and maybe because there are other confounders related to behavior or people in the lab that actually would not hold true. Okay, so I want to talk about the I want to talk about the proximate causes of why it breaks down, not the not. Right, so, so what are those? I want to hit more of those. Like what, what are the things besides non-representation small stakes uh, are, are leaded so that people are skeptical? Yeah, well, you know you're in an experiment, so you might alter your behavior to make the experiment. Okay, good, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to expand it to say, I'm just going to call it a high scrutiny environment. <coughs> okay, one element of that is that you know you're in an experiment. Yeah, but the whole, everything about experiments is set up so you're under a lens. Like, you know, you walk in, you sign forms, like process, the whole process is kind of exaggerated, right? And people read you, uh, you know, ridiculous sets of instructions, and then when you try to ask questions, they're like, you know, you know, don't say it out loud, you're gonna destroy the validity of the experiment and stuff like that. It's like this very all artificial thing. They ask you to do things, and, and, and everything you, you got your ID, sure, you know, maybe you don't write down your name, but there's like all these sheets and you have to sign them and you got to like, someone's going to look at them. Okay. It's a very high scrutiny environment, okay? And one thing that comes out of this is there's lots of evidence that people try to please experiment. What, what are some called, called experimenter demand effects. Okay. Basically, it is, it is the belief of most experimental people experimental experiment runners that you can induce people to do anything uh, in that experiment. So the Milgram experiments, you know, from back where, you know, back in the 1960s, you're not allowed to do anymore. Like those were good examples of how you could get people to shock other people and stuff like that. And, and it's just, it's just, you really can, if you give subtle clues, I think you can cues to people, you can get them to, to do what you want. I think a good example of this is, um, Stereotype threat, right? So there's there's a bunch of results in psychology that suggest that like, if you remind women that they're women, then they do terrible on math tests. Okay, so I don't know. I, I didn't know that women forgot they're women in general, and and why we might have else. But but the psychologists are able to get women to do terrible on math tests. Okay, but we've tried repeatedly as economists to 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 make women do terrible on tests, and we fail every time. Okay, and I think part of it is because like if a psychologist tells you you're a woman. You kind of say, well, the psychologist, I, I presume that what might be going on is they think, well, the psychologists um, are probably think that because I'm a woman, I should be bad. But if, but if the economist tells you, I think, at least in Chicago, the like case can't, maybe the psychologists can't even get women to do terribly on math tests by telling But we have had no luck whatsoever. And part of that could be because women try to figure out what the economist wants and thinks the economist wants something different than what the, um, than what the psychologist wants. Okay, whatever it is, uh, you failed over and over and over to find any evidence of uh, stereotypes, uh, which is supposed to be one of the pillars of psychology. Is it um, easier to lie? You, you know, fake your data, and then when people try to replicate, you say, "Oh, well, that's what I got." Um, <laughs> I, think, uh, uh, I uh, <laughs> Do you think that people? Do people ever lie and make up data in economics, Emily? Do you think that? Do people ever do that? You were making fun of me yesterday because I said somebody made up data, and you said I you should never ever really, say that somebody makes up data. Really, like just fabricate out of whole cloth. I'm sure that there are examples. I think it's got to be very, very, very rare. I think that's right. I think much more. I mean, I'm. Sh I know that it must be the case that people sort of screw around with their data to get data smaller, scattered errors, and that kind of stuff. But I think just completely fabricating data. Yeah. I think fraud is pretty rare. I think fraud is quite rare, but it is true that um, when you're in the, the data generation business, which is what experiments are, that, that fraud could be uh, more easily done. I mean, it is true that I've run across some particular authors who somehow repeatedly managed to come up with results that are far too good to be true and fail to be replicated, and one supposition you could make is that maybe the flip side of this, and it probably doesn't happen much in practice, but if someone goes to, to the trouble of uh, a lab experiment, 
uh, and documents it well. Uh, I mean, the thing you have with often uh, large surveys and so on, you some of that uh, some of that testing things is dropping different covariates and all that sort of stuff. And if if someone's honest about um, what information they collect, then then in some respects the the rigor that they can apply is arguably higher than if you're you're taking a large data set set where you can only ever use a subsample of the, the covariates. Yeah, I think you have both extremes. I think you can you can be ex even more honest in some sense in experimental work. But I mean, but oh, direct, direct, direct data, data collection. I mean, how hard would it be to cheat on experiments? I mean, not hard at all, right? I mean, you can erase answers. You can you can um, I mean, even better than that, you, you know, even you, you can give right if you know what you're trying to get. You can go around and make it happen, right? So that's the other thing. Is that you can you can send subtle, subtle clues to people in the way that you read the instructions and whatnot, right? In different sessions, that so you know there's a high incentive in session, and you you very you emphasize in that session. Um, it's very important that you work right to the end here, you know, extra stuff. And then in the one where you're not paying people, you say, I know it's a beautiful day out, so you, know, you probably want to stick around too long. So there are all sorts of ways you can go to your various ways to get what you want. Okay, and that's that's an interesting point to make. I mean, it's not the way people used to think, because you used to think that that's not the way people in our profession act. But of course, uh, when there are high stakes, people do tend to uh, do things like that. Okay. Uh, I got just a couple other things. Any other? Yeah. In experiments, oftentimes the incentives are just much more salient to the subjects than in the real world the analogy situations in the real world. Because they're there reading you the instructions and telling you the information versus in the real world, you know, there might have been that person asking for the five dollars in the subway, but I didn't even see them. But if someone had pointed them out, I might have gone and given them some money too. Or, yeah. or something like that. Yeah, and I, I that's what I would kind of love is emphasis on process. And and you really you strip away a lot of the context until the context that remains is, is, is very um, very focal and makes people think a lot about, about it. On the point about the high scrutiny environment, I mean, I'm not sure if there's a context in which you can study people where there's no demand from anyone to do something, you know? I mean, if people try to please an experimenter who they have never met, who they may never see again, then, I mean, that's the same problem seems with the natural experiment, with using survey data, maybe with even using administrative data, except there we don't know who people were doing the police. So I'm not sure how that. Yeah, so partly it's a question of degree, right? So we might be trying to please someone, okay? But I think when we get to the natural field experiments, let's talk about whether we think that's a problem or not. Okay, we'll, we'll always what we get will be specific to the environment we're in, but I think the, the broad class of concerns when it comes to lab experiments is it's an artificial environment. And what you learn about very clearly is how people behave in this particular art artificial environment that no one cares about. And what you want to know is, can I generalize from that artificial environment to some other environment that is maybe less artificial? And, and, it's, and so even if it's true that I, that I try to please experiment, okay, but I also try to please my teacher, I always try to, I try to please my wife or my boss, it doesn't mean that that is going to make it a seamless transition from from the um, the lab outside of the lab. Are any of you lab experimental types? Okay. So what else? Um, I have I have a couple I just have a couple um, other things here. One is that you have novices. It's kind of implicit what we said before. Right, you bring people in. You have to do a task they don't usually do. It really cuts out a lot of the market. Right, if you think about what the market is. Let's say, I, let's say I suffer from some horrible defect, like um, I'm risk-loving. Okay. Well, probably if I'm risk-loving, um, I, I, uh, I figure out a way to have someone who's not risk-loving handle my finances, right? Because I, I won't have any, if, if someone else finds out I'm risk-loving, they can just ask me to flip an unfair coin over and over and over until they take off my property. Right? So I've got to figure out a way to protect myself. You know, what, what do you do when you're faced with a problem you don't have the answer to? If you're in the lab, you don't really have any choice. Right? You're in some auction, you know, lab experiment, and you don't know how to do auction. But if you weren't in a lab, you might call up your mom or your dad or your brother or your friend or your old economics professor and say, hey, I got this really important auction. Can you tell me how to bid? And they'll tell you how to bid. Right? You close off a lot of the natural kind of market uh, functions of hiring uh, experts or asking friends about how to do things, and learning over time, right? These are also um, 
very, in general, very short-lived experiment, which can, uh, if there's learning, uh, or if there's if people get used to stuff, uh, attenuation, then you can. Uh, okay. And the last thing is, I think, I think it's in some sense, it's at least perceived as being too easy. Economists, psychologists are not of the view, but economists are of the view that it's really easy to think up a good lab experiment and to run it. And um, I mean, I've been joking about that, right? I'm saying how you could write three lab experiments instead of coming here this week. And for that reason, you often don't get as much credit, maybe, as you do uh, for writing a really, uh, a really good uh, paper in lab experiments. Okay. So in the end, lab experiments give you very high internal validity uh, and, and probably uh, relatively low generalizability. And my belief is that uh, lab experiments tell us a lot less about the real world than most proponents of lab experiments have argued over the last 20 years. And I think that the profession, almost entirely because of John List, is coming to agree with that. Okay, that basically what John has been essentially the only one out there, and he spent a good part of the last seven years taking every single result uh, in the lab and destroying it kind of one by one by one. Okay, it's been an incredibly good career strategy for him. Uh, every one of those pipe papers gets published in Econometric, R, A, A, R, G, P, P, G. Now all the, all the experimental economists hate him because he's like the worst kind of person because he was a lab experimentalist. Then he took that inside knowledge and he turned it against all the other lab experiments. So they all hate him, but personally it's been very, very good. So let me give you just one example of how he has managed to do this, how he's managed to use the lab against the lab. Oftentimes he uses other methods, but, but he's, how, how he basically um, has been killing uh, lab experiments. So we talked about the dictator game. Uh, it's not here somewhere, okay? So the dictator game and how influential these studies have been. I didn't tell you, but there are probably a hundred papers that use a dictator game and some guys, some different samples. All, every one of them comes to the same conclusion. Okay, that there's enormous amounts of money given away, which seems to support the idea that uh, at least in the lab, people have social preferences. So, uh, John started thinking harder about this question, and uh, and, I, and and we actually it didn't come out. We, we had a conversation right when he started his work, where, where I made this point about the subject. Because right, it always perplexed me why people were so generous in the lab but not generous on the subway. And John told me that he actually knew the answer to that problem. And, and he was working it out. Okay, so what did John do? Okay. The thing that John does differently than other people is he actually thinks. He thinks very creatively about what he's doing. And instead of just saying, well, I'm going to run the dictator game and I'm going to see what happens if I do it on um, sophomores instead of freshmen, okay, I'm going to do something different. Okay, so what, what John did was he said, well, let's just change the nature of how we play the dictator game. Usually it's, you know, I give the guy the five dollars and he can give away between zero and five dollars. And John said, well, what would happen if I changed the game so now I could give away five dollars or nothing anywhere in between, or in addition, I could actually as a dictator steal a dollar from, uh, from that person on the other side of, that, uh, of the wall. Okay? So what does economic theory tell you should happen? Okay, this is a distribution of plays in the initial game, okay? So let's, in, let's interpret this same thing everyone has. It's altruism, right? Okay. Now you change the game. What will happen? What will happen to this distribution? What would be your best prediction about what would happen to this distribution under that model? Many, many more people would choose zero. No, I don't think so. It's, I, look, I could have chosen zero in the first place. I didn't want to. I'd like to give my money away. I feel good. I guess it's more to blow inside, right? Nothing should happen, right? Well, who should be affected? I mean, the people in the yeah. X zero. these zeros. Yeah. You guys hear most of them are all going to go to negative one. Maybe not all, but a big chunk. But no one else should really be affected, right? right? That's the whole. That has been the entire twenty-year history of the dictator game. Is this is evidence that people care about other people? And and in the history of the twenty years, no one had ever thought to do what John was going to do. So John did it, and. Here's what happened. Okay, so here's the baseline. This is the baseline. This is what you just saw. This is what happened when you played the regular dictator game with University of Maryland undergrads. And this is what happens when you allow people to steal a dollar. Okay? So 
totally, totally went against what our theory predicted, right? Because it is true that about the same number, the only thing that worked is that about the same number of people picked negative one as picked zero before. Okay, so, so 25, 20 something percent of people picked negative one versus 30. So a bunch of people did pick negative one. Okay? These are different people, so you can't actually look at the time, the, 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 you know, an individual, uh, not kind of data. But you see now, lots of people pick zero, okay? And, 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 and very few people pick 2.5 anymore. So it's kind of weird, right? So, you know, on average, I think the giving went from like 30% of the endowment to like 10 or 15%, okay? So would you stop there and go write the paper? No. What would you do next? Uh, go to negative five. Okay, so go to negative five. Okay, how do you know it's going to go to negative five? Because it's negative <laughs> <laughs> So now it goes to negative five. Okay? And here's, uh, wait, hold on. This thing is sensitive. Hold on a second. How do I get, oh, wait. Okay, so that's where we are. Okay, here's the next one. Okay, so he goes to negative Wait a second. That's not right. Oh, yeah, it is. Never mind. It is right. That's right. Okay. So he goes to negative five. The same kind of people, but now you can either give away five dollars, give away nothing, steal the five. Okay. So what happens now? I mean, how strange is this? What, what is going on? I mean, that makes no sense whatsoever, right? Forty percent of the people. Yeah, these are the same people who, who are, you know, all want to give away money. Now they actually are taking negative five. I mean, sir, can you make sense? I'm, sure, I'm not even sure you can make sense of it. I, 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 there's one thing. Yeah. But it seems almost like a framing effect. And you also have $10 total there, right? It's just that you pre-divided it among people. So in some ways, like taking away five is equivalent to giving zero, right? It's just that it's framed as you having $5 instead of the whole 10. But it, in, from an economist's view, it's, it would be everybody having, it would be like you having $10, right? Uh, okay, so even when you give people $10, okay? I mean, so what you expect though, when you give people 10, uh, a lot of them give away half. That's kind of what you're saying. Right, so that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Is no, but it, because it, it is a framing effect though, because you're in control of the full $10. It's just that it's presented to you as being split pre-split already. Yeah, I, I still think though, if you think of this as altruism, if you think of this as altruism, uh, I do not think, I do not think the people who wrote the original dictator game studies, okay, if you had given them these data, I mean, given them this problem, they would have said, my prediction is that over 40% of the people will steal the $5 from the guy on the other side. And maybe they would, although if they did, then I think they gotta reconsider like the tw last 20 years they spent time on how altruistic people are. Okay? I'm surprised, I, I think you're right, that, 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 that look at it that way. But I think another interpretation of this, and I don't know if this is actually internally consistent, but, but another interpretation of this is through the lens of a simple model, where, where people care about two things. They care about their own wealth, and they care about how they're perceived by others. Okay? And what happens here is that what we're getting is essentially we're able to price out the point at which um, college undergrads will say, I really would like the professor who's running this experiment to think that I'm a good guy, but not $10 worth, right? So in the end, if I have a, if, if I have a choice of actually stealing, you know, walking out of here um, with, you know, an extra instead. So when I, in the original game, I can walk out of here with 10. In this other game, I can walk out of here with 15, but somewhere between 10 and 15 is how I value uh, my reputation in front of the professor. Like how, how much do I want to please the professor? Uh, enough to support, enough to give away some, to not steal the whole $10, but not enough to keep it from the whole 15. Yeah, that really doesn't seem like what's going on, because that would hold true if you, when you raise the stakes. And it seems when you do these dictator games for high stakes, you also have similar giving in, in the zero to giving frame. So I think uh, Tatiana is right that you're changing something about the framing of what's going on here. But from the economic perspective, this is the same as a ten dollar dictator game, but they look very different. Uh, right. Okay. So that's so, so that's so I think that's fine. I, I, 
uh, I still think, though, that uh, the framing part of it is almost like exactly the point of what the problem is with the lab, right? So the point is, whether or not this is the exact same game, it's kind of like the same game, but it gives very different, gives very different, but, but the frame is the opposite of what you said, right? I mean, this, this pattern, this pattern here is in some sense even, like the frame should be going the opposite direction, right? This is a frame which is telling me don't steal, right? This, this, this is kind of signaling don't steal, don't steal, and yet uh, these results actually look, it's almost like a lack of a framing effect for a bit of it. These results don't look that different than if you said, if you just give them the whole 10, how many will give zero, right? These are, these are like different from that. If you relabel everything from, from 10 to zero, but they're actually shifted in a weird direction, opposite of what you think the framing would be. Well, I just think you have to be careful about how you interpret what's altruistic, because here, zero is actually yeah. altruistic because you could have taken more. Like, so in a way, you're not being fully self-interested because the fully self-interested thing is to take the negative five. It is, okay, it, there's, there's some truth to that. But I do think that when we think about, right, but, um, but do you, when I, so when we talked about altruism in the real world, we didn't say, well, we said, well, let's look at charitable contributions. We didn't say, look, I'm an altruist because, you know, I saw one of you left your computer in here uh, during break, and I didn't steal it, even though I was the only one in there, right? I mean, we don't really, I mean, I think we have to be careful about what we're calling altruism. I mean, we could steal all the time, we don't, but we don't usually think of that as altruism, the fact that you know, I, could, I could, you know, punch some four-year-old in the face on the way home from school, I don't do it, but that doesn't mean, I mean, that makes me altruistic, because, I mean, it's not the only thing that makes it altruistic. Yeah, I think another critique of lab experiments is that people may have different preferences and different spheres of life, and when you put them in a different sphere, they may act differently, and this is almost like giving somebody a skeleton key to a house and telling them to steal if you want, and once you treat a subject as somebody who is potentially a thief and say steal at will, they may just have different preferences than if you treat them as an office. Okay, good. So now let's say if all this is true. Okay, we have all these different theories. So would you stop now and write the paper? And most people would. This would be a good place to stop and write a paper saying, whatever you think about the dictator game, when you change the rules, you guys are willing to steal a whole lot. Okay, but John, John is more clear than that. So John said, okay, well, let's do one more thing. And what he did was he brought the same kind of people into the lab, okay? but instead of letting them just play the dictator game, he forced them to stuff envelopes for an hour first. Maybe it was a half an hour, I can't remember how long. Okay. I didn't, no, no, it was an hour, because they had to earn, well, maybe it was a half an hour, because they only had to earn the five dollars. Okay. So he, he basically made the dictator and the other person stuff envelopes for an hour, and then he had them play this game. So the five bucks that they got was not a gift that came from the experimenter. They really had earned that money. Okay, so what happens now? Nothing, right? Exact same thing. Like why, should it, why should it matter if it's a gift or if you earned it? It's like a dollar is a dollar. We're economists, right? We don't have a dollar and effect and stuff like that. Okay, so what happens instead is this. Okay. So just to compare, look at the picture on the right and compare the exact same game and say they steal up $5 game. Okay, and before they work, it looks like this. And after they work, um, I went the wrong way, sorry. It looks like this. Okay, so a whole bunch of weight moves out of the steal five back to the zero. Okay, and I think it's because, I don't know exact reasons, but it's kind of like once you know that you had to work for the money, the other guy had to work for the money, you do a different, it's like stealing, it feels different. It feels different to steal the money from a person who just had to earn it than a person who just got it as a gift from the experiment. Okay? And I think this is actually kind of neat, because this final picture we have here, this is like the real world, right? Almost everybody wanders around, they don't give a lot of money away, but not that many of them are stealing from other people, they're just kind of like keeping their own money. And so it's kind of interesting that you can show that as you very, very relatively subtle things about this game, you actually end up in a place that that sort of mirrors the real world. But probably just by chance. But, Did he uh, try? I mean, the thing that seems to really mirror the real world, like the subway example, is you come in and stuff envelopes for five for an hour. You get your five dollars. Some other guy comes in at the end of the hour. They give him five dollars, and they say you have an option to, you know, take away. I mean, this guy, or sorry, this guy comes in. The question is, do you want to give him some? You just worked hard for this, okay. and he doesn't have anything. Do you want to give him some? So you vary. Not just did the did the dictator have. 
you figure whether the dictator works relative to the recipient, right? So no one's going to give the money away. After they work for it, even fewer people will give the money away. <laughs> that, I mean, that feels like that. Exactly. So, so maybe John should have done one more treatment that went in that, in that direction. Okay, but this is where John stopped, okay? And he wrote the paper, and he got it published in JP. But, but essentially, I think what happened here was John spent three days uh, of his life running these experiments, you know, three more days writing them up, and it fundamentally changed the way people perceive 20 years of research into the dictator game. Okay? And, and he's done this over and over with endowment effects, with like every kind of behavioral bias. He's shown that you can basically manipulate these like crazy um, uh, in the lab. Let me talk about one other thing before I move on to field experiments. Um, it is a general claim of lab experimentalists that one of the beauties of labs is that you control the context. But I think, in fact, that's actually a myth. That, that, so when you can tell people it is a one-shot game, but you cannot make them play it like a one-shot game. And I think people very strongly bring in their rules of thumb about, about how they operate in the real world, and they continue to operate that in the lab. And I think the best ex example of this is a fascinating set of papers written by uh, Herb Gintis and this guy Heinrich and like about five other co-authors. And what these guys did was, um, it turns out that anthropo a lot of anthropologists start their careers by going to some indigenous group somewhere that like doesn't have much contact with modern man, learning their language and hanging out with them for three or four years or six years and writing their dissertation. They write a book about it. And after they've done that, they have no idea what to do next, right? They wrote the book about this, this group, and they've invested a huge amount of the group, and then they're like, what's their second paper gonna be, okay, their second book? And so what they found is that these people were very eager that to be taught. So what, what, what Gintis did was he brought a bunch of these non-economists into a room, and he taught them how to play a bunch of different experimental games, and then he sent them all over the globe to go play these experimental games with the indigenous groups that they knew well. Okay, the idea was like, is there a homo economist? Will, will, this, will people play the same across the world or will they play different? And what was fascinating about these studies, which I highly recommend, is that people played totally differently. And the claim was at least that the way they played differently across societies mirrored very much the social structure. Right, so there was one group, there was one group um, uh, that was a competitive gift giving society. Right, so if someone gave you a gift, then you were morally obligated to give them back a nicer gift in the future. Okay? And in these one-shot lab games, it turned out that, um, in the ultimatum game, that um, these people uh, would give very, very generous gifts, like more than 50% in the ultimatum game, which like no American college student would ever do. And then the other person would reject the gift. Say, I'd rather have nothing than to get 80% of the gift from you. Okay? And that's God, it's just a reflection of the norms of their society. Yeah, but that shouldn't happen. That's what the lab is all about. The lab is all about getting rid of all the garbage that gets in the way of learning the answers. Yeah, but it turns out that people bring the garbage um, to the game, okay? And, and that really confuses what happens. I think over and over what you see in like one-shot games is you see people playing them as if they're repeated games, uh, even though the experiment is very clear about it, because people just aren't that smart, right? People, people have a hard time thinking about problems. They just use rule of thumb. And they use the same rule of thumb in the world, everything's repeated. So you, you play repeated even when you get into the lab. I don't know, I kind of felt like the reason I'm doing lab experiments is to like systematize the garbage, so to speak. You know, to see if there are any patterns in the garbage that people use to make decisions. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but I don't think, so I don't know, I don't think, I do not think that most people who work in the lab would say that it is a good thing that um, people, right, I mean, let me give you an example of where the garbage is really troubling. Okay? So you bring somebody to play a prisoner's dilemma, and it's a one-shot anonymous game. But in the real world, when you play a prisoner's dilemma, like with your wife or with your friends, you're playing it over and over and over, and it's repeated. Okay? And, then as a, as a, and then if you play that way in the lab, what do you learn? Basically, you, you know, what, what, the, what the lab should be about is telling me that once, right, one thing you can learn is that I can't use the lab to study one-shot games. Okay? I think that's what you might learn. Other than that, if people are bringing hidden context in, it's actually making it look more like the real world, except you have the illusion that you're controlling, but you're not really controlling. Yeah. 
seems troubling. It seems that if people inappropriately carry this heuristic to apply to one-shot games in the lab, you might then say that one-shot games in the world, they're also likely to oh, absolutely. carry this inappropriate Without heuristic. Question. So we have learned something very important about well, that's right. Okay, so, so, you can, so you can take it as a positive and say, okay, now let's go and show that in the real world, like that we should do, you know, that the way that we do one shot, like if I'm a if I'm a company, that I know that um, people will play wrong in one shot games. Tipping in restaurants Tip, that you're never you never go to. Yeah. So, but, right. So, we should, but people know that, right? I think that's people know they're never going back to those restaurants. I think they tip for a different reason, which is that even that you care about how that waiter is going to feel about you. We knew that, right? I think so. Then it's like I think there is a social preference for it. So I don't think that's a. I'm not sure it's a mistake. I don't think if you told people, wait, you don't understand. You, you shouldn't tip in a restaurant. Uh, you're never going to go to again because that's an artifact of repeated game. And people say, no, I know that. I know I, I'm never going to go back there. I tip him because as I walk out the door, maybe he's going to chase after me and yell at me or something like that. Or maybe I'm just going to feel bad about it. So it's tricky. But but these are the right kinds of questions to think about. You think about going. From well, I just want to say that I think that the problem is in lab experiments, people, it's not that you cut out learn anything if you interpret it correctly, but people don't systematically. And if they stop doing that, then maybe it would be okay, but they don't because they don't want to say, oh, we have all these real world problems coming in, we can't interpret our own thing. They want to say we can cope with this and we still get this, we can get it over and over again, and this means people are altruistic. And it's just wrong because it's not helpful. I want to learn about the real world enough. Yeah. So paraphrasing what you honestly, I mean, you, you cannot check your brain at the door when you do natural experiment research. You can't check your brain at the door when you do structural estimation. You can't check your brain at the door when you do lab experiments. You need to be thinking about what you're really, how to interpret your data. Uh, and it's not that they're about value. I mean, one good thing about the lab is it, it can allow you, for instance, to, I think, to get the direction of effect. Right? So you can see if I change. Well, two things. One is if you stay away from things where people are worried about how they'll be perceived by others, I think you have a much better shot, right? So if you want to see whether markets clear, you have a much better shot using labs to figure out how markets work, you know, or how people bid in auctions than you do about whether or not they care about other people, right? Because I think once you get out of the domain of the social preferences, you have um, lab, the lab is likely to be closer. Because a lot of what goes wrong in the lab, John might believe, a lot of what goes most wrong in the lab that people care about what other people think about them. And so in, in questions where that matters, you're not likely to get good answers. For questions where, you, where there's nothing moral floating around, I think you're more likely to get good answers. Okay. So this brings us to the field, the field experiment. Okay. So I think uh, my own view is that the, um, in principle, a natural field experiment is the ideal uh, research course. So let me just explain what I mean. Okay. So, how do you say what's good about the lab, okay, while throwing out some of the stuff you don't like as much as the box? Okay, so you gotta let, start with a lab experiment. Okay, and one generalization, generalization lab experiment is just to bring people other than students in the lab. Okay, I'm gonna ignore that. I have to basic view of the lab. Okay, so the next step in the path is something like a framed field experiment. That's what a lot of the um, what the social experiments have been, like moving to opportunity, um, or progressa, or the negative income tax, right? So, so it's, it's a real world experiment, okay? It has randomization, but one thing about it is that people do know they're part of an experiment, right? So they get surveyed a lot, uh, they, they know that people are watching what they're doing, okay? It's still quite good, okay? But not quite as good. So when we say a natural field experiment, what we actually mean is that you're using randomization uh, and you're doing it in people's natural environments when they're unaware that they're part of an experiment. So people are actually just doing what they're doing on a daily basis and they just happen to have been exposed to different prices or they happen to have been exposed to uh, a, different, um, uh, a different default on their 401k, okay, that, that, that some people have a default that has a lot of savings, some people have a default that has less savings, they don't know it, they're just going on the business. Okay. And I think, it's, in many ways for me, this is the ideal model for research, if you can pull it off. Okay. In that, many of the things you worry about, so you get as many of the pros as you can of a lab experiment, with a few of the cons. 
Now, it's not that natural field experiments, so there aren't that many natural field experiment papers. Right? I mean, there's, there's, there are. I mean, if you try to tally up the number of natural field experiment papers that are out there, they're pretty small. You know, there might be like, I don't know, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 of them, something like that in the history of economics. Maybe more, but not, not many more. Uh, probably less. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, most of them are pretty recent. So why is that? Why are, why are there so few papers that this is such an ideal way of doing research? <coughs> yeah, so it doesn't have to be costly. Uh, costly in what dimension? So I've run natural field experiment papers, and I, I've never had to pay a penny. Right? Because the thing is, they're natural, they're in the field. I mean, so all you got to do is, really the cost is you got to convince somebody to do something, right? So you need to be able to go to an airline and say, hey, you know, I think you're charging the wrong prices. So could I just entice you to charge a, randomly charge a different set of prices to, to some customers than others, okay? And if they say, yeah, oh, great idea. Right, that's a natural field experiment. It, doesn't cost, it might cost the airline something. Um, it might help the airline, hopefully. Um, okay, but it is hard. I mean, it clearly is hard in that dimension is that you got, either you have to, Either you have to like set up your own, you know, business or um, like um, you know, the internet site or whatever it is. Somehow you got to get people as part of their daily life doing some activity you care about, and then without them knowing, change it. Right? So it's hard to do. Um, I, I one of the reasons it hasn't been done is that economists just haven't thought of this as something that economists do. I mean, a lot of it. There's a lot of following other economists around. And so some economist starts writing about the labor supply of men, and then a hundred other economists start writing about the labor supply of men. Right? Bob Lucas writes some paper about uh, endogenous growth, and then a thousand other macroeconomists write about endogenous growth. Partly, and I, I have to admit that until I started talking with John List, it never occurred to me that as an economist I had the power that I should be going to companies and saying, hey, change your prices. It would seem like it, seemed like it would be it just didn't, I never thought to do it. And then John said, you should do it. I'm like, good point. Companies call me all the time. I work for economics. Companies always want to call me. And so now when companies call me, I say, hey, let's go, um, let's go you know, randomize stuff. And every once in a while they say, yeah, let's do it. Okay? You all have parents and friends and stuff like that. I mean, so honestly, I think <laughs> what I tell all my graduate students is the most productive 15 minutes you spend in your entire graduate career will be thinking about every family, friend you have, and whether any of them have access to the kind of data that could, first of all, just let you write a great paper, natural experiment paper, anything, but especially a natural field experiment, where do you know somebody who, because they're your friend, will let you mess with stuff that no right-minded person would ever let you mess with, uh, and write what would be a phenomenal John Mark paper as possible. Awesome. I also wondered like, about the human subject aspect of that, because, I mean, they really like you to disclose to people that they're part of the experiment. Like, have you ever had to get permission from them when you're doing these randomization, or does that fall outside? Um, of well, it's tricky because firms do it all the time, right? So all the time, airlines are changing prices, and nobody says to firms, uh, you know, you can't do that. And so uh, it's a good point. IRBs are not well equipped to think about natural field experiments. Okay? You think about the intellectual history of the IRB. It comes out of things like the Tuskegee experiment. It comes out of medical experiments where there was tremendous, you know, really nasty things were done to people without their knowledge. Okay? And what happened is the social science IRBs have adopted whole cloth with no thought whatsoever the medical uh, approach to human subjects. Okay? And um, so, do I think ethically there's anything wrong? I think absolutely not ethically. Then you do have to struggle sometimes with the IRBs to get them to understand that there's nothing going on. I mean, a lot of times the way to do it though is just to let the company, right? If the company runs the experiment and then lets you analyze the data, then by the time you go to the IRB, you say the company has run this experiment and they give me the data and it's no personal identifier. They already did the experiment. No one can get hurt from my analyzing. They got nothing they can really say about it. But, uh, no, but they worry about harm coming to people, and they say by changing prices you are harming. People. No, I agree with that. But once you get the data from the company, oh, the company yes. has done it. You don't see that. That's not even 
Right. The IRB does not even need to be involved in that activity. That's tricky. You should still probably, to be on the safe side, you should do an expedited. Yeah, should, you should, if you, 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 you push them on it, they yeah. would say if you would completely yeah. de-identify data, it's not going to be yeah. uh, But it is true that um, psychologists uh, get very nervous about the idea <laughs> that you've gone around these, these field experiments because I think they haven't thought very much about what it, why, why we seek to from. See, would you consider like the Kramer and Miguel Worms paper, like the, the sort of the literature, the the Duflo, Banerjee, Kramer world of? Would you consider that those experiments framed or yeah, natural or some other? Yeah, I think they always they always get permission. You don't they get permission from people ahead of time. They do surveys, exposed. No, they definitely yeah, yeah they yeah. survey them. I mean, I'm not sure that they always know. I'm trying to understand the distinction you make between sort of people know they're an experiment versus people know they're in a study. So there's, or they know, like they've been surveyed, they don't exactly know why. Right. Um, yeah, so, um, this is also so I don't know that it matters that much. I think mean, frame field experiments can be good. I mean, we'll be down. Yeah, no, 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 I, think, no. I mean, we learn a lot from that. Um, I do think that there, so it's, I mean, it's tricky, right? There's always, like, let me bring up another issue. So, so to John List, it's very important to him whether or not you as experimenter actually get to design the experiment. I'll give you an example. Um, there is a study done by, um, I'm getting so seen now. The, um, is that Maryland? Uh, Larry Oswald. Okay, so Larry Oswald wrote this incredibly good paper like 10 years ago that he never, never bothered to, to resubmit to the AER after he got a revised resubmit, in which he used credit card data. They had done all sorts of randomizations looking at the selection of other. Okay, and it's funny talking to John List. He's like somewhat dismissive of the paper because he says that wasn't a natural field experiment because the credit card company did the experiment and Oswald just analyzed the data. And my view is, why do I care who did the experiment? All I care about is the result, right? It's, it's, it's the same. But um, the key was, I think that. The key is, and sort of similar to your question, at least, the, the key is like what you get out of the data. Whether it's natural or framed, it's just a question of do you think that people are, are do you think that people's behavior will be biased by virtue of having been part of it? Okay. So the shortcomings of these natural field experiments, okay, number one, they can be super hard to pull off because you've got to convince someone that they should work with you on it. Um, but number two, even once you get working on it, you'll find that the people who you need to cooperate with you get very, very nervous, right? So it's not like the airline says, uh, you can charge any price you want. The airline says, well, you know, we're nervous. We only want to do little price changes as a start and stuff like that. So you end up actually being very much in a world like you are with natural experiments where you don't control nearly as much as you want to control. And they say, oh, well, we can't charge different prices of to the customers at the same store, so we have to make it like store by store. And then you know you just you start to lose something. Okay. Um, the third point is like any research, this field of experiments may not generalize. In you know, what, what sense will, will, will these field of experiments potentially not not generalize? One is general equilibrium effects, right? So it, so when you do when you do a field experiment, by its nature, it's probably going to be relatively small. If, say you work with a company. The competitors, right, so the competitors aren't necessarily going to respond in the way they would respond if you roll this out. Right? If you roll this out and you advertise, the competitors might respond. But there are all sorts of ways in which these new, it's, it's not a panacea, right? So you, say you can't check your brain at the door when you do a structural, but you can't check your brain at the door when you do a natural field experiment. It's always the same thing. You always have to be thinking through the lens of, um, of uh, of how theory comes in, long run versus short run, right? So you may find you may only be able to, to, to mess with things in the short run, and in the long run, things would you know things are more elastic, etc. Okay? But the answer to those are always that's what theory is for, right? Just as in the world in which you didn't have experimental variation, you use theory to extrapolate from what you observe to um, the things you have. Okay. So let me give you. Um, uh, let me give you some examples and a couple examples of some, what I think are some neat natural field experiments. You might quibble whether they're natural or not, that, um, that kind of hit home at, at these issues. Okay, the first one is a paper by Gavizian List, which was uh, published in Economist in 2006. 
So what they, here's what they were responding to. It's important to know what they were responding to. Um, you guys know the work by Akerlof about um, fairness and gift exchange and, um, and um, efficiency wages. So it's basically like making macroeconomic arguments about how the results in the lab on fairness play out in, to affect the macroeconomy. Okay, through the idea is that in the lab, if I do something nice to you in the lab, you reciprocate. Okay, it's like very easy to get that. Okay, so Akilov says, well, employers pay efficiency wages to their workers, and the workers say, well, that's a nice gift to me, so I'm going to work harder for the employer. This has macroeconomic impact. Okay. So this paper by John and, and Yuri Benizi are a response to that. They advertised for people here at the UFC to come in and, um, and do a job that, that was uh, six hours. They're told to get $12 now. They show up, which they do some horrible job typing in uh, um, ISBN numbers on, on, uh, uh, on books to build a database, um, something about lot, some libraries. Okay, so people, people presumably did not know they were part of any experiment at all. They just thought they were coming in to do some kind of job. Okay. What they did was for some of the people, uh, the no gift treatment, they just offered them $12 an hour. For the other people, they surprised them and told them that they would be paid $20 an hour instead of the $12 an hour they'd been promised. Yeah. Because it's like a gift. It's like an efficiency wage. You pay an extra eight bucks. Okay, it's a one-shot game. Right? There's, they, they try to make it clear that there's no, you can never be sure, but they, they, they try to be so that there's no reputation involved. It's not like if you work well for me now, I'll rehire you again in the future. It was, it was supposed to be a, a one-shot thing. So what happened? Well, it turned out that in the very beginning, for the first 90 minutes, the people who got the high wage worked a lot harder than the people who didn't. Okay? But as they kept on going further, until they finally got out six hours later, even, even four hours later, the two groups looked identical. Okay? What's kind of neat about this result is that there had been a bunch of lab experiments which showed that you could get these results, but all those lab experiments only went on for an hour or two. Okay? And from those lab experiments, People were generalizing to the labor market and the macro economy, saying, look, I gave this guy a gift and he worked hard for two hours. That means that if I give my employee a gift, he'll work hard for the next 30 years. Okay. And what's interesting about this study is it kind of says, well, maybe not. Maybe you give the guy his bonus and he does work hard for the next eight hours, for the next day, you know, two days. Okay, but what goes on in the next November, probably not going to happen. A lot. Uh, yeah. It could just be that they would like to work hard for yeah. Well, but if that's true, that's true of the macro economy, right? I mean, well, people relax every day, every day. Well, each day. So every day they work hard. Right? Okay, but that's testable, right? So you could go out. I wouldn't if I were you spend my time doing that, because I'm sure you're going to find that the next day, guys aren't going to work hard either. Um, but it's testable, right? It would, that would be super interesting. Right? If you could show that when I give people um, higher wages, they always work hard every morning, yeah. and then they're tired by the day. I mean, you could show that. That would, you'd be Akerlof's best friend because you would be reinvigorating this whole line of research. Okay? But I doubt that you would have to do it. Okay? Um, so they did, um, uh, they did the same thing as in the same paper but in different contexts about charity. People going door to door where they told people they'd get $10 an hour and then some people got $20 an hour. Okay? And they did it for a weekend and uh, they worked for six hours and so it's just kind of the exact same thing. So before lunch, these guys worked really hard, much harder. The red line is how hard you worked if you got the gift. And then, um, and then after lunch, everybody looked the same. Okay. So it's just, what I like about this is it's, it's like a very clever way okay, of figuring out how to answer, a, how, how to, number one, ask questions that matter. And they matter because other economists are building models and policy around the answers to the questions. When, if you think about it a little harder, I think it doesn't really make any sense, right? It, like the idea that Akerlof would go from um, two-hour experiments in the lab to the macro economy, it, it, it's like stretches credulity a little bit, okay? But you don't really think about it because he's Akerlof. He's got the Nobel Prize. You just kind of go along with it because that's kind of our nature. Okay? But then John comes along and says, "Well, this doesn't make sense," and he shows it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Did they vary the amount of the gifts and see a corresponding variation in the amount? Uh, so you know, they, I don't know. Guys know some of the not in this paper, but in the later stuff, they 
Not exactly. Uh, have they ever varied the gifts? I mean, John stuff. I can't think of any place where it's very good. They gave surprise low versus surprise high. Yeah, they've done surprise. So they've also had people come in and said, we're going to pay you between 12 and $18. Uh, and then people come in and they say, it's going to be 12 Okay, And those people aren't very happy. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and that's actually a really, that's actually quite, I wasn't going to talk about it, but I'll tell you about this paper. So what was really neat about this is what they, they did, it was stuffing envelopes. And they had a really complicated envelope stuffing problem where the people had to like match up names with like four or five different people. And then, and then at, the end, at the end of the day, you know, they sealed these things up and they put them to be mailed. But then before they mailed them, John and his co-authors intervened and they opened them all up to look and see not just the quantity, but the quality, right? To see whether or not um, uh, the people had screwed things up. And it turned out that they that the um, they kind of blew the power calculation, so they they didn't have enough power to really figure out much of anything. So now they're they're doing it a second time around with bigger power, but um, but it's an interesting design. Okay, so I want to keep you guys. I know it's been a long day. Let me let me just end with this. Um, the current wave, like the the development, like experiments are a good thing, right? If you can get experimental variation, it's good. Okay? But here's my own, this, everything I've said at this point I think is kind of technical, but here's pure opinion on my part. My view is that what passes for experimental research in much of the economic profession, okay, program evaluations where you go to a village and you dump some books and you go back to the village and see whether people know how to read, okay? But that is too easy. It may be important for public policy, it may be useful, but it's too easy to get rewards in the profession. Okay? And I don't think it's really caught up with people yet. I think, I think people haven't yet figured out how easy it is to do that. But easy, I mean, it like, doesn't take any skill. At least not the kind of skill that we usually work. My view is if, 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 they, um, if someone at the World Bank can do it, okay, then it's too easy for the top economists in the world to think that that's what they should be. Right, the top economists in the world have a scarce resource, which is like being able to think about economics and models and, and econometrics and, and, and ideas that the average person at the World Bank doesn't have. And so if you're not doing something harder than what they can do, you're not doing anything. Okay? If, you want, if you read through John Liss papers, and I think he really, he stands out head and shoulders above the other people who are doing experimental work. What you see John always trying to do is to figure out how, with experiments, you can test economic theory, how you can look for subtle predictions that go beyond just program evaluation to learn about things like you know, moral hazard, adverse selection, or to test different competing models. And I think that is, whether it's, regardless of what kind of empirical report you're doing, whether you're doing experiments, whether you're doing natural experiments, whether you're doing structural, it's that touch and that creativity and that sensitivity to the fact that you want it. You want to be, if you can, at this intersection of theory and empirics. Uh, that is the hallmark of people who are successful in the profession. I mean, there are not. If you think there are not many people who actually operate at that intersection. Okay, there are a lot of theorists. There are a lot of atheistical empirical people. Okay, but if you look at, say, the people who won the Clark Medal, people like Schleifer, or Murphy, um, Carr. Uh, maybe even Saya, as you might, you might say that. Um, Susan Athey, a lot of these people are people who are kind of at this intersection of trying to use theory and trying to use data and to put them together. And I think there are, it's hard. It's really hard to do well, but there are enormous rewards in our profession for doing it. Um, and I think if you want to have the highest expectations for yourself, as a future generation of people who are going to be writing the agenda, I think, I think you want to at least have a goal of being in that space. Uh, because I think it is the space that's most valuable socially, but far more important than that, it's, it's the space that gets you the biggest rewards, personally. And that's the thing you should be trying to maximize it, are your, are your, um, your personal rewards. Okay, so let me, let me leave it at that. And, uh, and I'll be back again tomorrow in the afternoon. And what I'll talk about tomorrow is probably I'll talk about a bunch of different approaches to, to pricing and profit maximization. So empirical approaches, thinking about how you think about pricing. I'll, I'll give you some 
papers that don't have any identification. I'll give you some papers that are natural experiments. I'll give you field experiments. And just kind of show you a bunch of different approaches to answer the same kind of question. Um, before we all leave, um, I know I sent out a big email today, and some people are following me and some people aren't. I just thought I'd tell you guys, um, let's meet up at the dorm at around 4.30. I'll be in the lounge on the second floor. Um, the plan is to hit up Millennium Park and then go north to the High Cocktail Bank Cabinet. Go to the bar on the second to highest floor because it's cheaper than admission to get a drink. Come down and then we'll go up to Andersonville for dinner. If anyone's interested. Thank you.